Okay, thanks so much. Uh, thanks uh, to all of you for being here. Uh, thanks Jesper because you've been the person who has been who has made this possible and thanks also the institution and all the rest of the people around who maybe they did something for for this record but but I don't know. So sorry and thank you whoever you are. <laughs> so uh, having said this uh, I want to repeat that I am thankful that you are here. I'm thankful that you are here because this is a very, very controversial topic. This is a terribly problematic issue. It's an issue that involves uh, lots of questions that are doubtful, but also it involves uh, certain questions that are very, very um, evident. Uh, however, um, we are all of us have certain certain views certain very strong intuitions regarding uh, the topic we are going to assess today. So I'm thankful for you because by being here you are somehow uh, showing that you have a, uh, let's say a disposition to question your own assumptions. So that's something that I, that I very much appreciate. Okay, so let's uh, start. As you see the title of this presentation is Natural Disvalue, the case for intervention. And uh, before, before I start with the, with the main reasons why I think there is a case for intervention to prevent uh, natural disvalue from occurring, I want to present you with the next thought experiment. I call it the case of natural health. What is this? Consider, uh, suppose, natural health. And it's uh, an untouched uh, natural environment in which there are a huge number of sentient beings who are suffering terribly suffering terribly. Their, their, lives, their, their lives are just like hell, and they die very, very soon. So they just come to existence, suffer terribly, and die. I think uh, we can perfectly say that this is hell, right? But then here comes paradise from intervention. So what happens is that uh, through some means, well, these natural processes are altered in a very significant way, and from the moment sentient beings now live in wonderful situations. Right? So they no longer are in, are in health. They are in this terrific place. So I think we should all agree that it would be definitely good to move from natural health to paradise from intervention. Right? It would be good. Most of us think it would be good at least if we were the sentient beings living there. So uh, I want to claim that this is what, ha what happens in the real world. And uh, if this is so, we should intervene. But, wait a second, there are some positions against intervention. There are some arguments that can be presented against this being so. And the first one is what I call the irrealist view, the wonderful view, which is that it, it says that nature is a natural hell, but nature is rather paradise. So according to this view, all animals live wonderful lives in nature. Then there is another objection, which is what we may call the speciesist view. And it just say, well, who cares about non-human animals? Maybe non-human animals are living in hell, but, you know, we are humans, we should just care for humans, so let them be. Then there is the environmentalist view. And the environmentalist view says that it should be forbidden to intervene in nature. So that would be their dictum. Thou shalt not alter nature for whatever reason. Nature is sacred, and uh, if well, nature produces some disvalue, if nature produces some harm uh, for non-human animals, well, that's the way things are. It's not that important. And then the fourth uh, argument against intervention would be the pessimistic view, which says that, well, intervention cannot succeed. I mean, we may think that, yeah, it would be great to alleviate the harms that animals are suffering in nature, but that's, you know, that's utopian. That can never be done. So I'm going to assess, in turn, each of these four uh, positions and see if uh, any of them, well, can succeed. If not, uh, we will be faced with the, the view that I mentioned before, that uh, we are living in natural health and we should change natural health. So let's start with the first assumption, that nature, nature is paradise. There are reasons to believe that this view is wrong. And these reasons, although well known for biologists, 
are often ignored by the general public. But first of all, let's present what, they, what this view uh, claims. There are two versions of it. The strong versions claim that living in nature is good for all animals, even if their lives just contain suffering and an early death. Whereas the weak version would say that, on the overall, in nature, well-being outweighs suffering. So the first view, uh, well, it may be a supporter if we believe that, well, you know, what makes uh, the lives of animals good is not the well-being that they have, but the fact that, for instance, they fulfill some, some role that they have in nature or some inner nature that they have. But if we believe that what makes a life good is the well-being that we experience in it, then we have to conclude that the strong version is definitely unacceptable. And uh, what happens then with the weak version? Well, the weak version would claim that, yeah, there are many animals suffering in nature, but there are others that are enjoying good lives. So this outweighs the suffering that the former uh, endured. Now, this is a view that, uh, according to several positions, would be unacceptable. For instance, if we are egalitarians, or if we are prioritarians and believe in the maximum principle, uh, it is simply unfair that some are enjoying if there are some others who are, you know, suffering to, to make that enjoyment possible. But other views, for instance, utilitarianism, would accept this. Anyway, uh, we don't need to have an argument here because utilitarians would also have to side with prioritarians, egalitarians, and others here. And the reason is that it, this view, this view that claims that, yeah, on nature, uh, suffering is outweighed by well-being, is just wrong. And the reason why this is so, the main reason why this is so, uh, has to do with uh, population dynamics. In particular, with this, this formula. And uh, uh, what this formula uh, is used for is to see how populations of animals vary through, through time. So uh, in this uh, equation, t means a certain period of time that is the time that uh, passes from, from the beginning till the, the, the last moment at which we want to examine that variation on, on the population. Then n is the initial population size, r is the reproductive rate, and k is the current capacity of the environment for this population. To put this simple, we have this formula, and for a certain time t, what happens is that a population whose initial number was n will vary depending on two things. How many offsprings are born, and the survival rate of the offspring. This is clear, right? Not problematic at all. Okay. So, once we see this, <coughs> we can guess that according to this, there are two main reproductive strategies on nature. And there are these two ones. We can maximize K, and then we have K selection. This happens when, for instance, uh, animals just have uh, one, one child, and they take lots of care of that child is the case. That's the case of human beings and of uh, great apes. Also, many herbivores, like for instance, um, elephants or wild bees, whatever, they follow this strategy for reproduction. But there is this other strategy, which is, which is maximized R. But then we have R selection. So case selection has to do with the survival rate. Our selection has to do with the number of new beings that come to, to, to Earth. And what happens is that, uh, on average, if a population is stable, just one individual per parent will survive. I mean, this is not like this. I mean, populations are varying all the time, right? So one population of animals may have 1,000 individuals now, and then it will have 500, and then 700. I mean, it varies. But uh, we may assume that on average, considering different species and so on, populations are stable. So this means that uh, for each animal that reproduces, one animal will be present in further generations. So, uh, 
you can now see the contrast here because what happens is that animals have more children than uh, the ones that remain. I'm using the term child and children liberally because, uh, you know, I think that speciesism is wrong, so I think that these terms can be used also for other animals as well. Um, anyhow, the point is that if we have two individuals at time zero, uh, if populations remain the same, that will mean that at time t, the two individuals, or rather, two new individuals will be present. But for our selection, there is something in between, which is this. That first of all, those individuals will have many descendants. And of them, just two will survive. So where does the other go? Well, we can guess it. Many of them die. They just die shortly, and they die in huge pain. So um, consider the case of, say, uh, a frog, which lays some thousand eggs. What happens is that some of those eggs would uh, never be broken, and uh, no sentient being will evolve out of them. But many, many, many sentient beings will evolve out of all those thousands of eggs. And uh, what will happen is that a minority, a tiny minority of them will grow up, and then a tiny minority of them will reproduce. So in the next generation, on average, there will be just two individuals per mother that will survive. So the rest of them, most of them, will die shortly after they come to existence. How do they die? Well, uh, in many cases they starve. In other cases they may suffer some accident or whatever. And in other cases they are eaten by other animals. And these aren't really nice deaths. And these um, ugly deaths uh, happen when they have just started to exist. So their lives didn't contain a positive value that could compensate that suffering. So we can say that suffering is just maximized for the sun. So uh, the problem with this is that our selection is vastly prevalent in nature. Almost all animals reproduce according to these structures. As I said, only some mammals and some birds uh, reproduce according to a different strategy. Many of them reproduce according to a combined strategy. For instance, I don't know, mice or dogs, they will have uh, not just uh, one, one child, they will have <coughs> lots of them, but uh, they will take care of them. But uh, still it's different from having hundreds of thousands of, of uh, descendants who aren't really taken care of at all. So what happens is that, yeah, most animals have huge leaders or clutches. As an example, bullfrogs can lay up to 20,000 eggs, cods can lay up to 9 million eggs, some fish, 300 million eggs. So what we see is that most species follow a reproductive strategy that entails that most of their members die very soon in pain. And that's the conclusion. You can read it there. So this is the main reason why in nature suffering is not just higher than well. It's overwhelming high. There is no possible comparison. For each individual that is enjoying in nature, there are millions, millions of them who die terrible, terribly, terrible lives, in, who have terrible lives and, and die in struggle. And not only that, what happens also is that um, in addition, adult animals uh, aren't living fancy lives uh, either. They often suffer greatly for reasons such as the ones that I put there. Injuries, disease, hunger, predation. And then, for instance, uh, some animals who, who can have a complex mental state, they also have to suffer fear, distress, sorrow. So. Um, the conclusion is that, as I said, nature isn't paradise. 
Nature is health. Nature is natural health. The thought experiment I pointed out at the beginning, it's true. It was reproducing what happens in real life. In fact, it's not just that this uh, view is, is wrong. It is very, very wrong. And as I said before, this is because suffering enormously <coughs> always well. So, uh, this is distressing, uh, but not for some people. Some people say, well, who cares? We just care about humans. Animals, forget about them. And uh, it may be that those who are here agree with me that this view is, is, is unacceptable, but it might be that some of you don't think so. So I'm going to say briefly some word on, on, on why I think we should reject this view. And uh, first of all, I would like to point out that uh, even if we <coughs> defend it as species is new, that shouldn't drive us to uh, reject that we should intervene in nature to help animals. Um, because as, as I said, the species argument, what, I, what, what, the, what the species argument says is that interest, uh, the interest of, of animals should come for little or nothing. And what happens is that if it comes for little, there has to be some point at which when we add all that little, little interest, this little interest plus this, plus this, plus this, and there are millions, millions. So eventually it must, it must come for something, right? So we can just uh, uh, say that we shouldn't intervene in nature if uh, we think that we should give no consideration whatsoever to non-human animals. And this is a very weird position and one that I think we should be here. Um, plus, we may say also that if we assume that well-being matters, as many views in ethics assume, then we are faced with the fact that, um, well, um, because animals, non-human animals, have a well-being, um, the harms that they suffer should be taken into account. So according to views such as the ones you can see there, uh, speciesism would be untenable. Moreover, uh, if we assume an impartial viewpoint, we can no longer accept what a speciesism claims. Because, uh, well, uh, we can perfectly imagine a situation in which we were in the situation in which non-human animals are nowadays. And uh, it is obvious that in such situation we would prefer to be helped rather than be left to suffer and die. So, uh, we could say that if we didn't know if we were going to come to this world as human beings or as animals, we would prefer uh, a situation in which animals are helped rather than left alone. So, if we are impartial, we are going to go for intervention. Plus, uh, we can also say that there is no argument from, for speciesism, no argument in support of speciesism that succeeds. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, present here two kinds of arguments. The first one, there are some that are question begging. Question begging. For instance, speciesism is often defended in a definitional way. Uh, many people say, well, we should just care for humans because they are humans, and that's the end of it. Some of the people say that humans uh, should be, um, should have priority over other animals for reasons that are that can't be verified. For instance, when they say, well, we have an immortal soul. We are the chosen species, uh, God uh, has chosen us, and all this. And what happened with these views is that, well, you know, mm, as I said, they beg the question because they don't provide any, any starting point, any propositions that we can uh, agree with. There are other arguments that uh, don't make uh, this mistake. So, for instance, species is sometimes um, defended by claiming that only humans have certain capacities, for instance, cognitive capacities, or certain cognitive capacities, that we have a language, and so on. And, and in some of the cases, it said that, well, you know, it's not that we have some capacities, but uh, human beings have a, a feeling of sympathy towards other human beings uh, that they don't have towards other animals, and this is the reason why we should respect humans and not animals. Well, what happens with this is that um, giving any non-definitional capacity or relationship, there will be humans who will uh, fail to have it. There are humans who don't have such cognitive capacities, babies for instance lack them, 
And there are humans who don't have those uh, relations of sympathy with other humans. So if we accept this, we would have to conclude that uh, yeah, it would be fine uh, to not to consider the interests of, of all those human beings. And this shows that speciesism uh, can't be accepted. So, um, we've seen that almost everyone, uh, we've seen that uh, humans, uh, sorry, that not human animals suffer terribly in, in nature, and I think that most of us would, uh, uh, would accept that if, if, if it were humans that were suffering that situation, uh, it would be right to help them. Actually, we would say that it would be wrong not to help them. Almost everyone would uh, uh, think that we should help them. So if speciesism is uh, unacceptable, then the conclusion is that we should also help non-human animals. So, the species' view fails, and uh, the conclusion that I've uh, reached before uh, seems to apply still. Moreover, because as we've seen, the suffering in the wild, the suffering that wild animals endure, is so terribly huge, that helping them is not just something that we should do. It's a very, very important thing to do. Right. So let's turn now to the third objection, the environmentalist view. Right. Um, there are lots, lots of environmentalist view. Uh, I'm going to present a, a simplified uh, version of it, or two simplified versions of it, and I'm going to claim that it, it's unacceptable. And I think that the arguments we can use against uh, this view will apply also to, to other similar uh, viewpoints in, in environmental ethics. So this argument says that um, natu natural processes and other entities that exist due to them, such as species, uh, biosynthesis, or ecosystems, are valuable. So, yeah, well, it is a pity, according to this, that animals suffer, but hey, that's necessary for these natural processes to go on. Now, I want to say that this view only opposes intervention in nature if we intervene by destroying nature. I mean, this is something we could do. We could destroy nature, and we would reduce the suffering of, of sentient beings in nature. But uh, we may also try to modify nature. So if we modify nature, and if we uh, alter these natural processes, what will happen is that there will be a substitution in the entities and the processes and, and the systems that there are in nature. So um, if environmental argument uh, just claim that it's, it is good that there are these processes in nature, well, this argument shouldn't really be opposed to this, because, well, yeah, there used to be these processes, but hey, see, now there will be these other ones. After all, ecosystems are varying all the time, and the ecosystems that were present some hundred million years ago are no longer present now. But still, I mean, do it... Uh, do environmentalists claim that evolution is something bad? Because uh, that's something that uh, alters ecosystems and may, makes them change through time? Well, they don't say that. So according to this, intervention should be perfectly acceptable. Now, there is a way in which we, this should be accepted if we assume what I call the qualified environmentalist uh, uh, argument. According to which, it's not that these processes or these entities are valuable, but that certain, certain processes, certain entities are valuable. Which ones? The ones that are present now. So, this view has very, very counterintuitive uh, um, uh, consequences. Because it, it implies that we should also struggle against evolution. Because if this environment, this particular environment, say the environment that there is, in, in the forest uh, surrounding uh, this town. If, if that's valuable, then we should keep them completely untouched. So we should stop evolution from, from, from occurring. So we should then intervene. Because if we don't intervene, those natural processes are going to sooner or later be substituted by other natural processes. So uh, this is somehow paradoxical, right? 
still, even if this view were acceptable, we can still criticize it because of this. We can say that this view is wrong regarding value. Because it's wrong regarding what are the proper locations of value. Because we may claim, if we think that well-being is what matters, that individuals and not processes or groups of individuals or systems are the real locations of value. Because, mm, you know, a natural process uh, such as the transformation of energy through tropic chains is not a sentient entity. A species as such is not a sentient entity either. The members of that species may be. Uh, neither groups of animals or, or, or landscapes. They don't have positive experiences. They don't have negative experiences. But animals do have them. So if we believe that well-being is what matters, we should care for these animals rather than for the environment. All this setting aside the problems that I have mentioned before with the environmentalist uh, argument. Also, we may say that the environmentalist view can also be, uh, can only be defended if we assume a species uh, viewpoint. And this can be shown easily by means of the following example. The following case. How is it the home? Suppose that the here always is sometimes um, defended by claiming that only humans have certain capacities, for instance, cognitive capacities or certain cognitive capacities, that we have a language and so on. And, and in some of the cases, it said that, well, you know, it's not that we have some capacity, but uh, human beings have a, a feeling of sympathy towards other human beings uh, that they don't have towards other animals, and this is the reason why we should respect humans and not animals. But what happens with this is that um, giving any non-definitional capacity or relationship, there will be humans who will uh, fail to have it. There are humans who don't have such cognitive capacities, babies, for instance, like them, and there are humans who don't have those uh, relations of sympathy with other humans. So if we accept this, we would have to conclude that, uh, yeah, it would be fine uh, to not to consider the interests of, of all those human beings. And this shows that speciesism uh, can't be accepted. So, um, we've seen that almost Everyone, uh, we've seen that uh, humans, uh, sorry, that not human animals suffer terribly in, in nature. And I think that most of us would, uh, uh, would accept that if, if, if it were humans that were suffering that situation, uh, it would be right to help them. Actually, we would say that it would be wrong not to help them. Almost everyone would uh, uh, think that we should help them. So if speciesism is uh, unacceptable, then the conclusion is that we should also help non-human animals. So the species view fails, and uh, the conclusion that I've uh, reached before uh, seems to apply still. Moreover, because as we've seen, the suffering in the wild, the suffering that wild animals endure, is so terribly huge that helping them is not just something that we should do is a very, very important thing to do. Right. So let's turn now to the third objection. The environmentalist view. Right. Um, there are lots, lots of environmentalist view. Uh, I'm going to present a, a simplified uh, version of it, or two simplified versions of it, and I'm going to claim that it, it's unacceptable. And I think that the arguments we can use against uh, this view will apply also to, to other similar uh, viewpoints in, in environmental ethics. So this argument says that um, natu natural processes and other entities that exist due to them, such as species, uh, biosynthesis, or ecosystems, are valuable. So yeah, well, it is a pity, according to this, that animals suffer, but hey, that's necessary for these natural processes to go on. Now, I want to say that this view only opposes intervention in nature if we intervene by destroying nature. I mean, this is something we could do. We could destroy nature, and we would reduce the suffering of, of sentient beings in nature. But uh, we may also try to modify nature. 
So if we modify nature and if we uh, alter these natural processes, what will happen is that there will be a substitution in the entities and the processes and, and the systems that there are in nature. So um, if environmental argument uh, just claim that it's, it is good that there are these processes in nature, well, this argument shouldn't really be opposed to this, because, well, yes, there used to be these processes, but hey, see, now there will be these other ones. After all, ecosystems are varying all the time. And the ecosystems that were present some hundred millions of years ago are no longer present now. But still, I mean, do, it, uh, do environmentalists claim that evolution is something bad? Because uh, that's something that uh, alters ecosystems and made, makes them change through time? Well, they don't say that. So according to this, intervention should be perfectly acceptable. Now, there is a way in which we, this should be accepted if we assume what I call the qualified environmentalist uh, uh, argument. According to which, it's not that these processes or these entities are valuable, but that certain, certain processes, certain entities are valuable. Which ones? The ones that are present now. So, this view has very, very counterintuitive uh, um, uh, consequences. Because it, it implies that we should also struggle against evolution. Because if this environment, this particular environment, say the environment that there is in, in the forest uh, surrounding uh, this town, if, if that's valuable, then we should keep them completely untouched. So we should stop evolution from, from, from occurring. So we should then intervene. Because if we don't intervene, those natural processes are going to sooner or later be substituted by other natural processes. So uh, this is somehow paradoxical, right? Still, even if this view were acceptable, we can still criticize it because of this. We can say that this view is wrong regarding value. Because if wrong regarding what are the proper locations of value. Because we may claim, if we think that well-being is what matters, that individuals and not processes or groups of individuals or systems are the real locations of value. Because, mm, you know, a natural process uh, such as the transformation of energy through tropic chains is not a sentient entity. A species as such is not a sensing entity either. The members of that species may be. Uh, neither groups of animals or, or, or landscapes. They don't have positive experiences. They don't have negative experiences. But animals do have them. So if we believe that well-being is what matters, we should care for these animals rather than for the environment. All this setting aside, the problems that I have mentioned before with the environmentalist uh, argument. Also, we may say that the environmentalist view can also be uh, can only be defended if we assume a species uh, viewpoint, and this can be shown easily by means of the following example. The following case: houses in the homeless. Suppose that here there are some people who are homeless. And they suffer terribly because, you know, winter is not really mild here. Uh, yeah, it's a cool place in all the senses of the world. So what happens is that these people suffer terribly during the winter. So for this reason, what they say is, okay, okay, we're going to build some, some houses around in the outskirts of the city so these people can be housed. I think most people would say, yeah, this is a good thing. Yeah, why not? I mean, this will uh, prevent lots of suffering and, and make death from occurring. And we would, we would also think it acceptable if instead of building houses for the for for the homeless, they build, I don't know, a library or or a new building of the university. Most people seem to accept this, but clearly, this means intervention in nature. Actually, we are intervening in nature all the while. We build roads, we build houses, 
we, I mean, we, we work in many ways. I mean, industry interferes with nature, agriculture interferes with nature, so we are intervening all the way. And, and this is perfectly acceptable. Most people think it, it is perfectly acceptable. Why? Because this furthers human well-being. So, how can we defend the, 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 uh, the environmentalist view and accept that housing the homeless uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is right. So, if opposing housing the homeless is wrong, then opposing intervention to help wild animals must be wrong too, unless we are blatantly species. Uh, moreover, the question that arises here is, would environmentalists really applaud natural health for humans? Of course they would. So this means that the environmentalist view must be rejected. Must be rejected. This objection against intervention does not work. And then we go to the we can turn to the fourth uh, objection, the pessimistic one, which claims that the intervention can succeed. And there are several versions of these of these positions. Uh, let me start with uh, with what I say, what I, with what I call the argument from helplessness in the strong version, which claims that it, it's impossible to reduce suffering and death in nature. They say, well, you know, when you intervene, you are messing things up, and then, you know, you solve this problem, and then this other problem com comes up, and then you solve the other one, and this other, so, you know, it's a mess. It's impossible to reduce suffering and death in nature. Then there is this weaker version that claims that uh, well, it's possible to reduce suffering and death in nature, but it's impossible to um, stop it altogether. Uh, what, what can we say about this? Well, first of all, regarding the strong version, we can say that it's simply wrong. It's simply wrong. And I can prove it. Because I can see an animal that is uh, suffering in nature, and I can give that animal some food for one day, and that means that for that day at least, the animal will be well fed, well fed, and he might be at home with me uh, in a nice environment. So I can certainly reduce uh, at least the suffering of one animal one day. So this, just this, already proves that the strong version is wrong. And of course, there are all the ways in which we can obviously reduce the suffering of animals in nature. Um, then. We may say, okay, well, this is an objection against the strong version, but uh, the weak version still applies. And I'm not going to uh, have a quarrel here uh, regarding this. I, I think that the weak version uh, is plausible. But, um, you know, uh, the weak version doesn't mean that it wouldn't be good to reduce the disvalued nature. So, against this, there is uh, a further argument, and it's the argument from unexpected consequences. So, in the strong version, the argument, this argument claims that uh, intervention will have a forcing effect, which could be catastrophic. And in the weak version, the argument just, just claims that, uh, well, intervention may have those consequences. What can we say about this? Well, first of all, we could say that the strong version is self-defeating. Because how can we assure that inter intervention will have enforcing consequences? Well, we can only assume, we can all, only state this if we know what those consequences will be. But then we can no longer say that they will be unforeseen consequences. And also the weak version somehow contradicts the strong version. Because if, if there may be unforeseen effects, then uh, uh, we can't we can't really state that this will happen because there will be some uncertainty. Okay, uh, I want to argue that uh, although the weak version is plausible, the pessimistic view is too optimistic regarding how things actually are in nature. And to see how this is so. I will contrast uh, uh, two scenarios. The first one is real world. 
And here we see what we've seen at, at first. That on average, for each animal that reproduces, only one of her uh, offspring survives. So, uh, this is what happens. And then here come the uprising catastrophic consequences. So this is the catastrophic scenario. Massive death. In massive death, total animal population is reduced to half. This is, I think, a, a very clear example of uh, unexpected catastrophic uh, consequences uh, according to those who defend this, this argument. What happens is that massive death is exactly like real world, except on one respect. Instead of those animals, 9,998, 9,999 animals agonize. Only one of them survives, not just two, only one. Well, you know what? Yeah, well, massive death is regrettable. But at the end of the day, if we are honest, it's not really, really that worse if you compare it to real world. Right? Real world is basically like, like massive death. And remember that real world is not just a thought experiment. Real world really is real world. So this means that the current situation that is going on when we are speaking here is already catastrophic. So the pessimistic view is very optimistic because it's pessimistic regarding the effects that we may cause, but it's really optimistic regarding what happens if we don't intervene. So what can we say then? That, uh, well, still, it would be possible to uh, uh, make things worse. And this is one way in which this could be done. And it's long a topic change. Suppose there is a reduction in the population of, for instance, elephants. Or other animals, uh, big animals. Well, what happens is that uh, if uh, big animals uh, disappear, the food they were eating will be eaten by smaller animals. And these smaller animals will reproduce. And we have a uh, huge uh, project, which uh, big animals tend not to have. And they will be eaten by other <coughs> bigger animals, who will be eaten by other bigger animals. So the longer the traffic chain, the more suffering that there is in it. So we may, we may intervene in a, in a way that created a longer that, rather than shorter traffic chain. So that would be bad. So here is this, it seems that we should do research on how to act. But that doesn't mean that we should not intervene at all. As we have seen, we live in catastrophe. So why not try to, you know, solve this a bit? Yeah, we should learn how to do it in the best way possible. But um, that's not a reason not to do it, or not to learn how to do it in the future. So, uh, to conclude, uh, you've seen already what the case for intervention. To summarize, uh, it seems that the argument uh, involved here leads us to conclude that we should help wild animals. Uh, it would be a good thing to alter natural processes to reduce the suffering and death of non-human animals. And um, so if, if that's good, then it's also surely the right thing to do. And uh, this doesn't mean, as we've seen in the, in the previous uh, slide, that what we should do is try to intervene massively now. Rather than that, what we should do is something like this. First of all, to question species. I mean, we won't be able to help animals until we want to help animals. And people don't want to help animals because people are species. And we should, you know, try to challenge that view, because we've seen it wrong. Then, we should also try to spread the interventionist idea, because, uh, because it's right. Mm -hmm. so. And um, we should also, it would be a good, uh, uh, it would be a good idea to um, support some interventions, those that are currently feasible and that may work at some small scale. For instance, I don't know if, you, if you've uh, heard about the work of, um, probably you have, 
about Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey, you know, these people who work with primates. They were strongly criticized by other, by other scientists because uh, they were intervening. So, for instance, uh, there was a, a polio um, epidemic in the, um, in the group of chimpanzees that uh, Jane Goodall was, was studying. And she was just intervening by feeding those animals who could no longer feed by, them, by themselves. But then eventually, uh, she vaccinated these animals. And uh, what are the reasons to say that her, her or their attitude was wrong? Well, you know, critics, uh, criticisms of this uh, attitude were saying, well, you know, uh, they were interfering with uh, the object of their studies. But suppose they were anthropologists who had a vaccine against some lethal um, disease, and you know, they are investigating some human community overseas, and all of a sudden they get this disease and they start dying. Would they still say that uh, it would be unjustifiable to interfere with the object of the study? Surely not. These claims can only be defended from a species point. Also, uh, sometimes some animals are actually treated against certain diseases. For instance, vaccinations, uh, vaccination sometimes occurs in the case of animals who, who live in the wild, wild animals. And this is carried out so, that, so those animals won't uh, get this disease and won't, won't pass it to animals who live with human beings. So it's perfectly feasible to, to, to act in this way. So if it's perfectly feasible to do it when, it when it's good for humans, why not do it when it's good for the animals? Then there are also other situations in which uh, animals are starving, uh, for instance because there is a drought or, or there is a specially harsh winter, in which it would be also perfectly possible to feed some of these animals. Consider, for instance, deer or elk starving because they can get access to any vegetable because uh, there have been some particularly uh, harsh uh, snow. Suppose it would be possible to feed them. Why not do it? And there are many other cases similar to this one. So uh, these particular interventions wouldn't imply massive interventions, but uh, nevertheless, they would, uh, you know, spare lots of suffering out there. So why not do it? And then the, the last thing we could do is, we could try to do research on ways to help wild animals. We now don't know how to help animals in a more massive way, but uh, eventually, who knows? I mean, history is really amazing. I mean, if, if you ask people even centuries ago whether we would be able to do the things we are able to do now, they won't believe it. And I suppose, for instance, in the Roman times or, or, or just 300 years ago, suppose they say, no, you know, I have this machine that takes a picture of what happens, and then uh, with this other machine, you know, I plug it, and then I send it, by one thing that is called email, and then this other person in Africa gets the picture. They will say, well, what are you talking about? That's, my, that's impossible. That will never be possible. Well, uh, you know, uh, they couldn't even imagine that that could be possible. And we can imagine this being possible, even if it looks very, very difficult to, to achieve nowadays. So, you know, eventually, who knows what may happen 100 years from now. At any rate, uh, if something will happen then, it all depends of what we do now and the ideas that uh, uh, are passed from generation to generation. So this may look like a very, you know, um, out of earth uh, argument, but I think it's something that deserves being taken into account. So uh, that's basically what I would uh, like to tell you. So thank you, and uh, if you have any criticisms or questions, I would be happy to, to hear them. Thanks thank a lot. Very much. I hope I understand you correctly, but I don't agree with the basic premise that there is either
a natural paradise or a natural hell. It seems to me that a fish feasting on 10,000 uh, frog eggs is experiencing natural paradise, but the fish eggs being feasted on are experiencing natural hell. And the reason I, I can say this is because I don't believe you can put a value on the suffering of the fish, which otherwise would have starved to death, or the uh, frog eggs, which are being eaten uh, just before they are born or something like that. Uh, it seems to me like you're only concentrating on the numerical size of the smallest species. The, the tadpoles are the most important things because they are the, the huge numbers and their collective suffering is worth more than the fish. Mm -hmm. And I think you will run into great problems if you try to quantify that in the way that you have to quantify it in order for your argument to work. Do you have any comments? Uh, well, this uh, leads you. Leads, uh, I mean, this leads us to a, a, a much wider issue: the issue of quantification in axiology and ethics. Mm, I think we are making decisions all the time, and we make decisions in which we ponder the harm. So we are quantifying that. We are quantifying all the time. And uh, regarding this, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say that. Well, you know. If this animal is uh, uh, having a great life, but for that to occur, all these animals have to suffer this, you know, uh, it's not worth it, because all this animal suffering is more important than this, this well-being. And I think if we, if we take the case of human beings, we would definitely see clearly, I mean, suppose that for our society to exist, we have to torture for uh, two minutes, newborns, huge amounts of them. Uh, that would be something really mm, mm. counterintuitive in that, right? Uh, all this setting aside the fact that, well, I happen to be a, an egalitarian. So I believe that uh, uh, if you have a situation in which uh, uh, there are two individuals with a well-being of five, so it's five and five. And there is this other situation in which there is one individual in paradise, I don't know, 20. And then this other individual in hell, minus two. Even though the second situation has more value, for me, it's unacceptable. Because uh, it's, not, it's, it's not justified. And, and it's not just that it's justified. It's, it's worse to have such a war because of the suffer, unfairly suffer by, by that individual. So, I can't just say re with regards to this that I simply disagree with, with that premise. I think, with those premises, I think we can perfectly uh, uh, quantify the amount of suffering, and I think that we do this in, I mean, in everyday life. So, yeah, I don't think this is a, a, a strong objection against this. Wouldn't but with the numerically larger populations of species, would they always be on the benefit side of an intervention, according to you? Uh, well, I mean, dependent, depending on, I mean, if you have bigger, bigger uh, population of uh, our selection followers, then that works. So, uh, because the fact is that you may say, okay, if there existed more individuals living in happiness, that would balance a bit the situation. Yeah, but in real life, in real life it doesn't work like this, because then in, in a matter of years, those animals would uh, crowd the earth. So unless you intervene to change the way they reproduce, uh, if you have larger populations of animals being happy, that means that you have even larger, much, much, much larger uh, groups of animals that are suffering in the way I've mentioned. Okay. Oh, uh, well, I just have two points, and I think I follow Philip's idea. I think that, of course, nature is no paradise, but you seem to say that real nature is, is hell. But that seems to be a misunderstanding, I would say, because it seems to me that I would think it's quite reasonable to think that uh, the majority of animal lives is worth living for them. Even though they may be short lives and they may suffer, and some may not be worth living, it would be better that they never existed at all. But why should you think that, that uh, for instance, living a week or two or a year or see, and then suddenly you eat, be, be eaten by?
by a, a wolf or something like that, but that would be, make that life uh, something of a, of a hell. It would be a very good life, I think, even though the, the, the ending of it may be perhaps a, a, a paradise, I mean. But uh, why should that... So you, if you count together all these bad things, I mean, it may not be a bad thing for an animal to die, I mean, death is not, ne not necessarily bad for an animal. It's, it's a very complicated thing why, if death is bad. I mean, it to depend on lots of things. But, of course, suffering, if the dying process is suffering, it's hard to say that it, would be, it wouldn't be good. But it could uh, may, will be compensated by a lot of other animals that will feed on these kind of animals, that, that, and they have a good life and, and things like that. So why, I mean, uh, Rawls was famous for saying that Utilitarians didn't take the distinction between persons seriously. And I think you take the distinction between animal individuals too seriously. Uh, it doesn't matter very much whether they die or not. If they suffer, of course, that, that may be. And the next point, my, I think that's, so to say, well, is no help but it perhaps could be better. And then the question is, what kind of intervention is there? Are you really... I mean, if, if it is a controversial is issue, it, it depends really on... If you go, for instance, the, the best thing would be to exterminate all, can, all predatory animals, or perhaps all animals. Uh, that would be a very controversial idea. But there are lots of interventions that people do, and that's not very controversial. And, and what, what kind of, of, of intervention is, uh, are we supposed to do in order to, to take care of the serious things that you think we are doing? I mean, it, this uh, children's idea, Tantantra's idea that, well, perhaps it would be best to exterminate all predatory animals and do the killing ourselves because we can do it in a more nice way and we can eat them and feed them and, and it could be nice. But, I mean, we could perhaps kill them very without suffering compared to a lion, for instance, when it kills these uh, deer that doesn't look very nice, I would can agree. Uh, would that be the kind of intervention that is you have in mind that we should... I mean, you really had something I did that perhaps it would be best to exterminate all the groups. Okay, so there are basically four, four points in what you've said. So the first one has to do with the issue of death. I personally think that uh, uh, all, all sentient beings, all conscious beings, that uh, we may say are identical to themselves through time, have an interest in not dying, because I can think of two possible lives for them, life a and life, and life B, and if I compare life A against life B, and life A contains more well-being, then life A is better than life B, so death is the event that causes uh, life A not to occur and life B to occur, so death is a harm for them. Uh, so, but anyway, I think that this is unnecessary, because we could also um, assess the problem by just looking at, at uh, suffering. So this is the second point. I mean, if, if all these animals lived for some months and then they, are, they were killed painlessly or with just some minor pain, mm -hmm. and, uh, well, mm, in the meantime they lived uh, happy lives, then I would agree. I mean, uh, nature wouldn't be the hell I've described. But uh, things aren't really like that. I mean, uh, many animals just uh, live for, for days. Some just live for, for hours. And uh, some animals never eat. So they become conscious and then they just starve. And that doesn't seem a very good life. Uh, and some other animals, uh, yeah, maybe they can experience some hours of well-being, and, but then uh, they, are, they are slowly eaten by other animals, and this doesn't seem to be a, a nice death either. Plus, some deaths are really, really, really slow. I mean, for instance, consider the case that Darwin was claiming that um, led him more strongly to, to doubt uh, his religious uh, beliefs. The case of uh, Ignium wasps. 
they lay their eggs inside the caterpillar bodies, and then uh, when the larvae uh, comes out, they eat the caterpillar by respecting the, the vital organs. And this may take a while. So this is a long death, very long death. So even if the life of this animal contains some well-being before, you know, all that is value that there is in it uh, afterwards seems to outweigh. Plus, uh, in addition to this, the lives of adults aren't really, really nice at all. For instance, something that has been discovered in places such as Yellowstone, in which predators have been reintroduced, is this. Um, they reintroduced uh, predators such as wolves in, in, say, in Yellowstone. They've done it, and they've been discussing it around in Northern Europe as well. And uh, the reason is that when they introduce these wolves, and uh, then deer or elk won't go to certain areas. And the reason is not to keep control of the number of, of, these, of these animals. It's so that they don't go and feed in certain areas, so then trees may grow there without being eaten uh, uh, from the beginning from, by, by these animals and so on. And what happens is that when they feel the fear, they are malnourished. So they've done this analysis in, in, in Yellowstone and discovered that uh, deer are now malnourished. But the natural situation is not the one that existed before, when the wolves weren't there. The natural situation is the one that they are undergoing now. So uh, there are lots of animals that are suffering all the time without us noticing. Um, I would say most uh, herbivores are suffering from, from malnourishment, but there are a lot of them that are. And there are diseases that are wide, uh, widespread in nature. And the uh, whole population affected by, by, by terrible diseases. And we don't know about them. So in general, uh, we have reasons to believe that, uh, that suffering really outweighs uh, uh, well-being. Uh, I don't know exactly if I believe this argument, but I, I throw it out uh, So it, it, it's um, sort of an environmental counter-argument to your thesis. Um, it would seem that uh, evolution is actually a process that maximizes uh, decay strategy. Uh, if you would see, uh, follow it, it would seem that uh, from the beginning, uh, single cell organisms and such, they are all harm maximizers. And because there are no, point, no uh, possibility for such an organism to really defend its existence, it's only a, a way of surviving is producing maximum number of offspring. So as evolution carries on, it would seem that uh, if the uh, fraction of species using a K-maximizing strategy instead increases with time. As evolution progresses and uh, uh, life forms become more and more complex, it would seem that they have the ability to choose the other strategy and maximize um, survival and thereby probably maximizing well-being as well. Uh, because probably survival rate and well-being is so much linked. So it would seem that evolution by maximizing survival, which it seems that uh, evolution is all about, um, by doing so, it is a process that um, drives uh, change in nature towards more uh, k maximizers and better k maximizers with longer lifespans and more uh, and probably richer lives. And we are in the here in in the present. We are uh, a good example of uh, powerful uh, k maximizers. Um, and uh, it would seem that how can we know that uh, if we interfere with nature and stop everything right now, how can we know that this is the, as good as it gets? If we, maybe if we let the process go on uh, and in millions of years, uh, the fraction of K maximizers will outweigh the R maximizers, or maybe uh, billions of years. And then perhaps uh, there will be uh, 
uh, creatures that experience well-being on a scale that uh, we can't even comprehend. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as in such a way, it might be that we are um, in the grand scheme of things, <laughs> so if we say so, um, hurting the total well-being by stopping evolution right now, where, uh, well, most of animals suffer. And it seems to me that the only um, counter-argument towards this is from species' view that views humans as something like as, as good as it gets. We say that, okay, uh, we should stop the care because we can and because we think our lives are the, uh, such a good thing. Yeah, that's a very intelligent uh, uh, argument, and uh, it's based on something that is right. However, it's just partly right, and that's a, that's the main problem. Evolution uh, progressively introduces more and more complex individuals, and then case selection appears because case selection requires very complex individuals. So, yeah, uh, if evolution went on and on there would be more case selection in the viewers. Yeah, that's very, very likely. Unfortunately, uh, case selection individuals are big individuals. Uh, you need to be a, a so complex an individual that you can't have case selection at the level of uh, small invertebrates, for instance, or even at the level of very, very small vertebrates. That's the problem. And there are huge amounts of these animals. So even if, uh, suppose that evolution goes on and on for millions and millions and millions of years, the, the scenario you described will occur uh, at the level of big animals, but you will still have our selection at the level of smaller animals. Moreover, uh, even this would be very optimistic, because what happened with our selection is that our selection is uh, generalistic. So um, if I mean, for instance, when there is some natural catastrophe and uh, suppose that there is some earthquake and, and the land is destroyed, the first individuals who will, who will colonize that place are Arab selectionists. Case selectionists just can't do that. They can just live in, in very, very fixed environments. So when you alter that, those environments, they, they disappear. Well, unless they are like humans and they have some technological means and all that. So uh, what happens is that even uh, even if uh, if we accept the picture you have, you have mentioned, apart from the problem with small animals, we will still have um, room, plenty of room for 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 our I selection think, as well. Uh, I think you are partly wrong in, in what you say that uh, there will always be our selectionists because um, if you if you disregard humans for a moment. Mm -hmm. and, and just think on the evolution and the yeah. of uh, case selection. Uh, if you would stretch this uh, for extreme uh, yeah. periods of time into the future, and uh, we would say that perhaps uh, the Earth itself it gets destroyed as uh, the sun swallows it uh, up. Yeah. The only uh, species that could survive such a thing uh, would be uh, cave uh, maximizers. Uh, and the our maximizers would simply uh, get uh, eradicated. Well, yeah, in that scenario that would be so, but then you would have introduced <laughs> this factor we, that you refer to also that means destroying nature. So if you destroy nature, yep. and then some of the some of the beings who live in nature go on living by other means, but in nature, I mean on planet Earth and on similar biospheres, you can't. And the reason is, you can't have so complex uh, uh, behaviors for so tiny uh, uh, individuals. These very tiny individuals may have a uh, nervous system, centralized nervous system that allows them to suffer, but uh, they can't have the nervous system that they would require in order to grow their, their, their babies up. So, um, and then I, I just uh, say also, Well, I mean, you could 
if you believe in the singularity and all these things, you can live this society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a small <coughs> thought. Uh, yeah, you talk as if the, uh, or some would argue that we're not actually responsible for the suffering that occurs in nature, mm -hmm. uh, that occurs naturally in nature, and it, and therefore it's not our, uh, so we're not the cause of it, so therefore it's not our responsibility to do something about it because it happens naturally. While there are much much animal suffering that we are the cause of. Uh, should we, isn't that more likely, isn't that our responsibility that we should focus on to to uh, minimize the suffering that we actually cause and put our, e put our efforts in that rather than feeding animals that starve because of the natural conditions that were already there before us? Well, I think that there are reasons to do that, to focus on, nowadays, to focus on on the harm that animals are caused by humans, but not for that reason, but for somehow mm, reasons that have to do with how ideas can can be spread, right? So uh, all these thoughts regarding intervention in nature are are thoughts that will need some time to be, you know, tasted and digested by people, right? Whereas everyone can see that uh, what we do to animals in, in farms is, is terrible. And uh, also I think that this is so because, as I said before, I think one key idea here should be that we should question speciesism. So if we have a speciesist society, uh, we will never care for, for non-human non animals, whether they live in the wild or not. And uh, this is important because also uh, it often happens that uh, animal defense movements forget completely about questioning speciesism and they speak of yeah well reducing the harm that we cause to animals or being kind to animals and all that and I think they should uh, incorporate uh, the idea that speciesism is bad so speciesism is discrimination just as other discriminations we are more familiar with are and, and we should question them. Uh, having said this uh, so this is the the, the key reason why I completely agree with, with you on practical terms. You know, I, I think that, for instance, myself, I am a vegan and I know many vegans, so I'm not responsible for uh, people, uh, other people, you know, uh, breeding animals. I'm not responsible for that at all. So, uh, just as I'm not responsible for uh, a wolf eating another animal. So, I don't feel that in itself there is something particularly bad about one animal being killed by a human that is not present when that animal is killed by an animal if we take the animal who's killed point of view. If we take the point of view of the agent, then there is definitely a difference. Because, you know, the, 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 the other animal, the other non-human animal, is not responsible, whereas some humans are responsible agents. So, from the point of view of the agent, there would be a difference, not from the point of view of the, of the harmed animal. But I'm here, not the agent. So I'm caring for animals not because I'm responsible for them, but because I think that it would be better if animals weren't harmed. Well, you can, you can say that you indirectly uh, are responsible for the suffering of animals because you're part of a society that, that kind of um, uh, destroys the environment. Like just the fact that you use computers and buy clothes. But I'm also part of the environment that causes suffering to the animals. The environment is not a good thing. In environment, uh, as we've seen, environment that is real world is hell for animals. So I'm part of that environment too. So I may use the same argument to say I'm responsible for those animals. Why? Because I'm living in Earth, on Earth, and I'm living on Earth, and I'm happy. Well, I'm not happy, for, I'm not particularly happy, but I'm. <laughs> <laughs> My life is worth living. <laughs> So, yeah, but the lives of these, all these animals is not worth living. So I may say that this makes me responsible for the suffering. I don't know. According to some, this might be an argument, just, uh, just as according to some, it may be an argument in the case of farming and all that. I, I, I just don't, don't uh, you know, don't agree with that way of, of, of looking at problems. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I have several questions, but I take one now. Uh, 
I mean, even if you agree, you wouldn't want to agree with you that uh, nature is as hellish as you think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem obvious to me that there are not other uh, states of affairs that are equally hellish, for instance, human suffering. Uh, so, w hoping not to be a speciesist, I tend to think that human suffering, some kinds of human suffering are generally worse than any kinds of, of um, animal suffering. And I base that on the fact that, uh, I, so I wrote myself, but uh, I mean, mm -hmm. you have also referred to to our views on, on welfare and you know, stuff like that in, in your talk. So I think that that's the only way one, one can do. And, and if I go to myself, I would, for instance, tolerate uh, a very, very large amount, I think, of physical pain uh, if I had to choose between that and, for instance, losing one of my children or losing my wife in an accident or something like that because of that kind of psychological pain. And the kinds of animals that are, uh, are responsible to the most of the suffering in nature are those who, who don't care about those things. So they obviously cannot, hopefully they are not, they do not, they, they, the parents of, of the frogs are, are not in pain because they lose their children. I think we can. So, 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 so then I would not disagree with you, but I perhaps would say that we should put our uh, resources somewhere else. We should, uh, perhaps this is, this is a question where we have reduced the third world suffering, we have reduced the poverty in the world of human beings, then we can start to look at those frogs and yeah, things. Well, uh, if you compare, I mean, there are uh, 7,000, around 7,000 uh, or 7 billion uh, human beings on Earth, and the number of animals is very, very difficult to calculate. Some estimations have been that it's uh, 10 to the power of 19, maybe. Uh -huh. And that's, I mean, that's 19 period. So, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if we if we agree that we may quantify, I mean, there's lots of suffering. Uh, moreover, uh, well, you know, uh, when you present the case of your of your children or your wife, you know, uh, maybe the reason why you do would say uh, take those pains is because you care for them, not because you have some egoistic uh, thing that you want to spare yourself the suffering, right? Is, is because you want to. So it's not really a it's, it's not really a, a good example I, uh, because uh, you know uh, I could I, I could agree with that. But for instance, if I if I want to think of any any psychological suffering that I that I may 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 you know go through, I can also think of terrible physical suffering that would equal them. I mean, well, maybe some of you haven't, but I think most of us have been in psychological states that uh, due to psychological suffering have been so unbearable that if we had to continue, continue, you know, undergoing those mental states, our life would not be worth living. But we, I, I think most of us have been in similar situations when it comes to physical pain. Uh, those of you who haven't, well, you've been lucky. So for instance, when I, when I, when I think Imagine the suffering of, a, of, of, I mean, I haven't put any, any, any picture or anything, but uh, there are these pictures of this, there are these videos of this baby elephant who's killed by, by hyenas. And they, you know, these animals, they don't, they don't kill you by suffocation or so. They kill you because they bite you and take off pieces of your, of your, of your flesh. One, another, 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 until you die. So you are almost a, uh, a, uh, uh, completely disfigurated and, and, and you are still perfectly alive. So the difference between a, a, a living body and a corpse really vanished there. And, and I can think of the fear or, uh, or, and of the distress of that animal. But even if, yes, if, if I just consider the physical pain, that's lots of pain. And I think that pain can be as, as bad as any psychological suffering I can, I can endure. Perhaps, but uh, I mean, that's not the kind of pain that those frogs, I guess, you, you wouldn't be doing. Right. It, because you, yes. know, you cannot go on so long I agree. ripping off the skin. <laughs> I agree. So, agree. so agree. I would put the elephant more on my side. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, uh, well I, 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 I think, because I believe that uh, lots of uh, smaller suffering 
kind of way that people are suffering. Just for instance, if you say, what do you prefer? You prefer to be terribly tortured for one day, and we'll do all kind of bad things to you. We'll fart we'll over your body and put things on your fingers and do all these terrible things to you for one day. Or we will be beating you up, which is, you know, not as painful, for one year. You yeah, torture me for one day. I would buy it. So why not uh, doing all these calculus as well when more individuals are involved? Uh, I see no reason for it. Anyway, uh, as I pointed out, uh, the lives of all those animals are less, less, less uh, paradisiacal than we, think to, we tend to think. Uh, so it may be possible that even the lives of, of adults contain much, much more suffering than we think they, they contain. Do you still think that kind of quantification is controversial? I mean, okay, it's, with your example, it's still within the same person. It's you who feel that uh, you're beaten up every day for mm. year or you are. Mm. But, but when you... If, if, if everyone here uh, was also... Uh, it's okay that we get beaten up one day uh, so that one person can be saved that kind of torture that you... It's not... It's not it's, since it's not the same person experiencing those beat ups every day. Mm. It's not as that bad. So I mean, it seems... I, I, I don't think you can... Okay, let's see. Suppose, suppose we are talking about humans, right? So the, the case is, there are uh, there is human suffering, uh, like the one you've presented, people uh, who, have, uh, who go through difficulties in, in their lives, and then uh, there is the suffering of all these other individuals, uh, some of them uh, just exist for one day or some hours, and then they suffer, but because uh, they are newborns, they don't suffer as much as human beings, as, sorry, as, as adult humans, but they are trivial. Still, I would think that that would be more problematic. But then also, note that you claim that we should focus on human beings, but then there are far more animals suffering in nature, even if it is not just uh, the, the topos or, or, or other animals I've, I've mentioned, but other animals, grown-up animals, that are suffering uh, terrible harms that are equal to those that humans undergo. Moreover, uh, we should think, I mean, I don't, I don't really know how the statistics are as regards suicide. Because many people undergo terrible harms in their lives, but they still think that their lives are worth living. But they might be wrong. They may be wrong, that's right, but in many cases they aren't. Perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the back. Well, I was uh, thinking somewhat along the same line as you, but I would like to phrase it in a different way. When you uh, were was asked to work to comment upon what kind of intervention you had in mind. I think you retract more or less to the idea that we cannot say so much perhaps about the uh, very striking things about interventions, but what the most important take home message from tonight is that you should fight the species or speciesism. And that, that is the important message. And I start to, to wonder how clear that concept is really, uh, considering everything that is said. I mean, if speciesism simply means that one should not treat animals as uh, automats like uh, Cartesius, for instance, then everybody agrees, I think, more or less today. But if you also start to talk about, really seriously, the possibility of intervention to create something more similar to a paradise than what we have today, then I think it sounds outright silly not to take into account that there are many different species and that they might have very different uh, 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 um, conditions uh, determining what the effects of our interventions would be, then we should really these species would talk really serious uh, into account whether a larva, for instance, has the same kind of experiences as, as you. If you. I mean, if you talk at the same time about fighting species and, 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 and the next minute about the dreadful things that happens in the larva, uh, it becomes, uh, to me, it becomes uh, too... Uh, uh, to little nuances in this uh, 
this course to make any sense uh, at all. Well, um, noting and taking into account that there are individuals who have different uh, interests and that individuals from different species typically have different interests is one thing. And that's not a speciesism. What is speciesism? Speciesism is this. When you have this individual who has this interest and you have this other individual who has this other interest. And this interest is more important for him than this other interest is for the other one. And you nevertheless pay more attention to the interest that, uh, that is less important according to the species the individual uh, belongs to. That's speciesism. So for instance, suppose that um, I can inflict some pain on a human being and a dog. And suppose that the, the pain won't uh, leave any, any uh, effect on, on neither of them. So they won't have uh, any trauma thinking about this or, or anything. After that, I will give them a pill that will make them forget the pain. Suppose that the pain that the human being will suffer is slightly milder than the pain the dog will suffer. Then it is worse to cause the pain to the dog. Because the interest is the same. But, but do you think that this view is so unusual nowadays? Is it that rather the opposite that most people would uh, think along these anti species lines, actually? No, I, I disagree. I think that if you present this, if you present what the, the, the example that I just uh, presented, if you ask people, most people would say, no, 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 it is worth to cause the suffering to the human because he is a human or she is a human. I have the other intuition that most people would say that depends, you have to weigh here. And, and one, one has to be very careful in, 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 doing, in making this way. That's why we have laws protecting animals, that's why, we, that's why we have the ethical committees at universities, etc. Et uh, I disagree, for instance, if you think about the, these ethical committees, uh, it, it's, it so happens that, they, that their view is to control uh, experiments on non-human animals. But their view their, is not to control experiments on human, on human animals. Why? Because the latter aren't carried out. So uh, yes, people course, assume that it's perfectly justified. But that's that's harm. plainly wrong. There are the committees for that. That's the reason. Pardon? That that's plainly wrong. That one doesn't make experiments with people. One makes lots of experiments with people. But there are other committees. Uh, oh, but uh, yeah, of course. But uh, but not the same uh, kind of experiments. I mean, uh, no, of course not. But, but not really invasive uh, and against the will of the of the of the subject, as it happens in the case of of of, of, uh, of non-human animals. I mean, I think this is obvious. And if you, if you take a, a, a look at uh, how uh, experimentation works nowadays, it's obvious. It's plainly obvious that uh, uh, animals are suffering things that will never ever be done to humans and that are completely forbidden. So. If we can cause this suffering for to, to non-humans, and uh, by doing this we get some benefit, we say, well, you know, it's justified. We are we are sorry. We have to care, we, to, we have to cause it, and we want to minimize the suffering and all that. But we will still perform it. But they don't think in the same way with humans. They don't say, well, you know, we are going to minimize. We're going to cause a painless death to this uh, to this uh, baby that we are going to use in this experiment. No, they simply. Disallow completely any kind of experiment of the kind. Also, you know, uh, if we go and look around, we will see that the, 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 the flesh of animals is, is, is served as food everywhere, and the flesh of humans with similar cognitive capacities never is. So, uh, so this clearly shows that there is some species difference here. Because we may say, well, you know, we may say, you know, the, the problem is that they, they aren't harmed by death because they don't have categorical desires, uh, as some people say, or some philosophers say. Well, you know, but here I have this baby, he, he doesn't have or she doesn't have these uh, uh, desires, these categorical desires either. You know, he's an orphan, so you can, no one cares about him. Nevertheless, no one is. So it's obvious that we live in a terribly species of society. Okay, we have to, I have three more questions. I think if, if those three questions are short, I think we can go through with all of them. But uh, the first, it's, you have some, someone up there. Uh, is that still yeah. there? Yeah, I, I was just thinking about, uh, I, I've been thinking all this time about quantifying suffering. 
and I tried to get that together in my head. And I think you, uh, I, I, I kind of got the hang of it uh, just a moment ago, I think. If we compare, uh, if we, for example, say we pinch someone, and that causes slight pain, but only for a short period of time, and when the pain is gone, you won't be traumatized by it, and you will have forgotten about it two minutes later. If you would pinch uh, a million people, would that amount to cutting off an arm of one person? I, I, don't, I, I don't see how it could. I mean, it, it, it's not like, it's not simple uh, uh, plus minus math, like pinch plus pinch, pinch plus pinch equals determinants in the end. Well, yeah, but come on, I mean, if you... I see the point of your argument, but we are not talking about and, you know, pinching some animals. We are talking about animals who come to a system and starve and die and, and they feel some suffering out of it. And then they die and they never ever live again. And that's harmful for them. So it's not something as trivial as, as this, uh, as this um, sensation that I get if I, if I get some culture or, or, or anything. So I think there is a difference. So, uh, as I said, let me put the, the example in this other way. Suppose that you, there is this room with uh, one human being and then there is uh, lots of room filled with newborns that, uh, you know, they don't feel so much pain and they will be killed in, in a matter of, of minutes or seconds or, or hours, that's it. And then you compare this against the suffering that this human being will have because, you know, well, uh, he is undernourished and he doesn't have a job so he can't uh, adequately uh, meet his needs. I would still think that the, the case of these other, other human beings, the newborns, would be worse. Anyhow, I mean, it's not really necessary for the case of intervention, for the case for intervention. And this is something I, I made, because maybe because I want to stress so much the point that there is so much suffering in nature, I may be compromising the idea of intervention. The idea of intervention uh, uh, can be defended even if we just assume that a species system is wrong and we just know that there is one single animal in need of help in nature. Because that would give us a reason to help, those, uh, to help that animal. So suppose that, no, nature is paradise, but with the exception of these few animals. I will still defend the case of intervention to help those animals. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I would just, I just use the, the, I just appeal to quantification, and uh, when I have to respond to this argument that say we should focus just on human suffering, because I, I think that uh, in that case it's when comparison uh, carry out. And the thing is that it's not me who is um, uh, thinking that we should do some calculus. Is that? The others are also doing a calculus, but they are reaching a, a different conclusion. Okay, uh, back to uh, the short question. <laughs> short. <laughs> because it's it? 9 o'clock, should we take it afterwards? Or? No, well, I, I think, <laughs> so, suppose we think, suppose I'm right, that the death isn't the, the real problem. Is there all this, so to say, if we could put a, a thermometer of pleasure and pain into the areas of the place. And we take human beings. I think, do you agree that, that uh, there would be more pleasure than pain in the human region? Or do you think there are more pa pain than pleasure? If, if you don't think more about what, what, when we die that we may lose and so forth. Just, I, I would, since, I would, I would what your view on that? I think that in the case of human beings, there is more pleasure than pain. What, uh, yeah, and, and I think, why should we think that? Well, most lives are worth living, even though they are not very good. Yes. And then you think, uh, well, this is not true about most human lives. The no, non-human lives. That they, even, so to say, when they, mm -hmm. an animal that is living for a year or something, walking around in the forest and having a nice time, and there are lots of pleasure in it, you can assume and there are some, some pain going on. So, I would think that most animals do have a life worth living. It wouldn't be better for them never to have, have existed. Yeah. Uh, so, it's strong to think, reason to think that there are more pleasure in the, if we look at the wild world, so the 
not found in the humans. There are more pleasure than pain in the in the universe. <laughs> I disagree for the for the reasons I've mentioned. Isn't that oh, under MS estimate pleasure? No, no, no. I think that uh, there are lots you are under, underestimating suffering. Yeah, no, you know, I, and I can tell you what I, I can tell you what I can tell you what was the 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 process that uh, drove me to think this. I started to do research on this uh, because I was concerned with animals. I was into animal ethics, and my intention was to prove that environmental destruction was very bad for animals because animals in, in nature are, are, are living good lives and we are disturbing those good lives. So that was my, my, my initial uh, thesis that I wanted to prove and I was very biased towards it. And I, and I started to do research and do research and do research and, and I read some papers that were really shocking about this and at the end I had to uh, gave up my previous uh, uh, ideas about this. So it's not that I have a tendency, to a pessimistic view about things. Uh, it took me some years to bite the bullet and believe that. And now I believe that's it because, uh, because I've seen how things are. But that's biography rather than evidence for this calculation of the pattern pain. So to say. If you take a natural system like Serengeti, lots of animals going around, there are lions and things, and they die. Do you should think if you look at about that, you more pleasure than pain, or do you think there are more, more pain there? Uh, think of an animal. You all think of an think of a, of a wild animal for a second. What kind? Right, you have it. Who has? Who of you thought of uh, one animal who is a, a baby animal and has just come to existence and is gonna die? I think that maybe now, well, maybe some of you have because we've been having this discussion. But if I asked you before, most of you would think of lions, uh, elephants, giraffes, uh, dolphins, but none of us think of small animals who are not going to make it through, through adulthood. And very few of us think of um, invertebrates. So we have a prejudice in, in that sense because our, our mind uh, uh, deceives us. And when we think of wild animals, we think just the picture you mentioned, the Serengeti, yeah, the lion, the gazelle, all that. But we don't think about, yeah, you see, those small fishes, the starving, they have no food. Those small fishes, the biggest fish uh, comes. The wasp that put the eggs uh, in the caterpillar and the caterpillar is eating why alive. Do huh? why, why, why do you think they suffer? Why do you think they suffer? I think there is, uh, we what? have a reason to think they, they may suffer. What? The, um, the, the insects are suffering? They have, well, they have a centralized nervous system, so I don't know. Very suppose good. that I think that the problem, that the, suppose I think that the probabilities that they suffer is 0 0.001. Still, because they are uh, 10 to the power of 18 or 19 uh, of these animals, because the overwhelming majority of the animals that exist on Earth are them, that would be equivalent to having 10 to the power of maybe 15 uh, animals we know for sure that suffer. Now we have to take the last question, and that's your question. Yeah, just a short comment that when, when I was thinking about this, uh, it was really scary to, to think about the case of uh, yeah. widening the circle of compassion and a new issue to care about, but I think you have uh, made a case for us not to go out and do a lot of things in this, this issue, rather to if we just see a little bit the, the suffering of the lives of the wild animals, we can maybe see more, feel more uh, deeper for, for, uh, for animals in, in farm animals, for example, that we can, can uh, make something for, for, for in, a, in, in an easy way. So that's my, uh, the value of, of this for, for me. Thank you. Good, thank you very much.